Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Toby Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q&A. Coming to you from the Holy Land, Rabbi Toby Singer, welcome back. How are you, sir? I, you know, I, I say that because I want people to really look at the text. I want people to really just drink the text, absorb the text. Just let it fill you. It's really quite beautiful. So let's really unpack this. So we're talking about Daniel 9 in the last 24, 25, 26, and 27, the last four passages. So what's happening for the caller, I have a lot of respect for him for having the courage to call in, is that he's using a Christian Bible. Why would that make a difference? Wow. So it makes an enormous difference. I don't want to unpack this. The word Mashiach appears in the Hebrew. Mashiach means Messiah or Christ is just the Greek. So that word Mashiach appears in the Jewish scriptures 39 times in the Hebrew. It's there. It's easy to count. Now, as it turns out, what Christians Bible do, Christians Christian Bibles do, is that in not all, not all Christian Bibles, there are many Christian Bibles that are honest here. You know, the Revised Standard Version, a new Revised Standard Version, but it's the same suspects that come up over and over and over again, who, who just jam the text. And what they do is in 37 places where the word Mashiach appears, it's a Hebrew word, they translate it correctly as anointed, right? And, but only here in Daniel 9 verses, in these texts we're talking about, it translates the word Mashiach as not only Messiah, they amp it up even more. They then put a capital letter, so it's capital M Messiah. Open your King James Bible. I mean, if if you have one, if you're in Borough Park, Brooklyn, you probably don't have a King James, but then just take my word for it. What they do is they number one, they translate the same word that's translated in Leviticus five and those in, in Habakkuk three thirteen, where it translates as anointed, same word here is Messiah. It gets crazier. And then they capitalize it, even though there's no such thing as a capital letter in the Hebrew language. So that's a complete theological translation. It has nothing to do with the text. And then it gets crazier, and they put in the definite article. They put in a definite article. So that comes nutty. If you look at the King James in Daniel 9 verse 24, says the Messiah, the Prince. But the word in Hebrew, there's no word there, the, there's no definite article. It doesn't say HaMashiach. So they complete, this is a, a scam. <laughs> and that's why good, honest, decent Christians read this text in a new international version and are convinced that this is talking about Jesus and are convinced that the Jewish people are blind, utterly blind, that there's a veil over their eyes. And Paul was right in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. There are scales over their eyes. They can't see. They can't see what is so obvious. That's what's going on. You, you notice there's something very interesting that's going on is that Christians, I think nice Christians who have a favorable view of the Jews. I don't want to talk about, you know, I was talking nice Christians have, who have favorable view of Jewish people are astonished that Jews can't see the obvious. It's their book, their language, and they're clever people. They have a, quite a reputation. How could they not see that Daniel 9 is talking about the Messiah? It says it right here in my King James. I'm not kidding. This is, this is how many Christians feel. They really just don't understand why a people so wise, so smart, it's their Bible, they can read it, I can't read it, but they don't realize that the problem is that, that they can't read in the original. Jews, conversely, look at Christians, I'm talking Jews who have a favorable view of Christians. 
Jews go, I can't believe like this Christian is like a perfectly normal, intelligent person, but believes in Jesus. Like, how could you not see that Daniel 9 has been so manipulated by the church that it's 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 not even – you can't even recognize what the original text says if you're reading through the Christological filter of the Christian translator. Here he is right. The translations are partly characterized by a strongly Christocentric theology, and the insertion of the definite article and the nonification do not correspond to the text. The Christian Bibles need, the, need to eliminate the two anointed ones discussed in these four passages from verse 24 to 27. There's one who's an anointed prince, a Mashiach Nogid, in the text, in the Hebrew. And he gives the command to rebuild Jerusalem. This is not right. He does not give the command to rebuild Jerusalem. It is only said there that he comes. So from the going forth of the word, that means from the destruction of the first temple, until we have a, a king who says, who's a Mashiach, an anointed one, who gives the command to, for the Jews to go build Jerusalem, build the temple, It's seven weeks. Seven weeks is 49 years. That means 50, on the 50th year. The following should be noted. First, the destruction of the first temple is the wrong starting point for calculating the weeks of years. Second, he does not give a command to rebuild Jerusalem, but from the going out of the word that Jerusalem would be built again, Jeremiah 25, until his coming there are seven weeks of years. So the text says... Well, think about it, my friends. From the destruction of the first temple... Singer gets his starting point from the Talmud. He is wrong, because from 586 BC, the destruction of the first temple, to 70 AD, it is not 490 years, but 656 years. The Jews therefore erase 165 years from history, and this is called the Lost Years. Something happened 50 years later. Singer now calculates, starting from 586 BC, the destruction of the first temple, 50 years to 536 BC, the year Cyrus gave the decree to build Jerusalem. But this is wrong. 49 years later an anointed prince was to come, and not a decree to be passed. So says the angel in Daniel 9. Something happened 50 years later. A Mashiach rose up and said, Jews, go back to Jerusalem, rebuild it. Go build, back your, go build your temple. When Cyrus gave the decree to rebuild Jerusalem in 536 BC, he was no longer a prince, but already king of Persia. But Daniel 9 says that the prince is coming, and not a king. Something happened 50 years later. A Mashiach rose up and said, Jews, go back to Jerusalem, rebuild it. Go build, back your, go build your temple. Who is that? Cyrus. How do you know? It says it. Where? Isaiah 45 verse 4, 45 verse 1. It's really 44.28. That's the end of the chapter. And then 45 verse 1, the beginning of the next chapter. That is correct. Cyrus is called an anointed one in Isaiah 44 and 45. Cyrus is also meant in Daniel 9. The outgoing of the word to rebuild Jerusalem happened in Jeremiah 25, verse 1, in the year 605 BC. 49 years later, Cyrus came, at the beginning, still as a regional prince under Astyagus. Isaiah 44 and 45 announce that an anointed one would become a king, King Cyrus of Persia. As king, he would then give a decree, but not before. Daniel 9 only announces his coming, nothing more. Forget the chapter break. It literally says just what I said. No, it just doesn't. And crazy, crazy, crazy. I'll, I'll let you guess without looking it up. Do you think in Isaiah 45 verse, verse 1, will you have the word Mashiach, the Koresh, 
which is Cyrus, is my Messiah. Do you think the King James Bible is consistent and translates it there as Messiah, capital M, or do they translate it as anointed? Think, based on what I've told you, just take a guess. The New American Standard, take a guess. The New International, what I'm doing is I'm going through all the suspects, the usual suspects. We're doing a lineup, criminal suspects. The answer is you know the answer. You don't have to look. They translate, render it correctly. Same exact word. In Isaiah 45.1, Mashiach is translated as anointed by these Christian translators. And here in Daniel chapter 9, they translate as the Messiah. Well, how, where did you get that from? Why did you do that to me? You should go right back to your Christian bookstore and say, I want a refund. <laughs> this book purports to be a translation. It's not. This is a human, a, a, this is a crime scene. This is a, a, this is a, a fabrication. This is a, this is a complete twisting of the text. Right? This is fraud. This is not just like, whoops. This is very well calculated. He is not wrong. Some translate the Messiah. Every translation is also an interpretation. Some translators imply that Daniel 9 is about Christ, but it isn't. It is about Cyrus after seven weeks, and of Antiochus Epiphany after 62 weeks. But neither the Christians nor the Jews believe that. Nevertheless, some interpreters have to put up with this criticism of the rabbi even if he himself calculates even more abstruse. All grope here in the dark. Now, let's figure out what's going on here. There are two anointed ones here in Daniel 9. One that comes after seven weeks, meaning 49 years, that's Cyrus. He's different than the second one, because this first one is a Mashiach Nogid. Nogid means a prince. And a second one who comes after a subsequent 62 weeks, which is 434 years. You know what the Christian Bibles do? They conflate. I don't want to go far here. I have a whole chapter on this with all the chronology in volume one. He now does not want to continue the Jewish view, because otherwise he would have to admit that 165 years are missing in his Talmudic calculation. But... It, they conflate it to, that, in, that the Messiah comes after seven weeks and 62 weeks. No, it, it's after seven weeks. And then at, that's why I look at the next verse, verse 26, and after the 62 weeks. It doesn't say after the 69 weeks. This is all crazy, but I don't want to lose you here. So let's go back to this. Here too he is right, for Daniel 9 states, And after 62 weeks an anointed one will be cut off. But he does not say after 69 weeks. Thus he severely challenges the Christian interpretation, which reckons 69 weeks. He reckons from Cyrus 539 BC to the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD. But he can take for this only the remaining 62 weeks, 434 years, because the first seven weeks, 49 years, are already used up with the period except for Cyrus. 539 minus 434 are 105 BC. Up to 70 AD, still 165 years are missing, and the rabbis simply delete these from the history. So simply it is. So he also gropes in the dark. The anointed one who, cut, who is cut off after, uh, in verse 26, after 62 weeks, 62, it doesn't say 69 or 70, 62. Who is that? That's the priest. According to the Talmud, the anointed prince to be exterminated was the high priest in 70 AD. But there were several high priests at that time, and they were certainly not princes. So that doesn't fit properly either. You know that the word Mashiach, or anointed one, 
is used, as I mentioned, 39 times in Tanakh. It's never referring to the Mashiach. It's referring to a whole, whole range of people. What they all have in common is they have a, a leadership position, but the word is used most frequently about a priest who is the son of Aaron. He knows that all this does not fit so properly, and he's just talking himself into it. What happens during the war between Rome and the Jewish people in the year 66? Why is this important? Because Daniel then sharpens in and it is revealed that in the last week, for ha half the week, after half the week, an anointed will be cut off. What is the anointed one? Don't they the Messiah? It means the priesthood would be cut off, the high priest out. According to the Talmud, the priesthood, in the middle of the 17th week, was denied access to the temple by Romans, who allegedly broke their agreement with the Jews. This is what is meant by the term cut off in Daniel 9. But that doesn't fit either. For if anyone worked on the Sabbath, he was to be cut off according to the law. This means death and nothing else. Singer and the rabbis must also adhere to a consistent interpretation, not just the Christians. Besides that, Daniel 9 does not say that an anointed one would be cut off in the middle of the week, but after 62 weeks. I'm a priest, but I can't bring sacrifices. I'm eligible to bring sacrifices based on my, um, my genealogy, my family. For, please God, the Mashiach will come very soon and I'll be in the Beis HaMikdosh in the temple bring offerings. That's, that's, but I can't. In fact, the only thing a priest can do today is really fulfill the negative current, the things that we're not allowed to do. I'm not allowed to go near a dead body. So I can't do that, but I can't bring sacrifice. So the priesthood, meaning all the 130 commandments associated with sacrifices alone in the Torah, those are not going on today. Judaism is the only religion in the world that cannot practice its religion because they cannot practice the law without a temple. That is what he means by this. Now, now it's true that the temple is, is destroyed, and he's right on that. And I wanted to bring out a point, because according to Christian tradition, Jesus was killed in the year 30 or 33. Why there's a difference is not important. Let's say he was, he was crucified in 30. But what, so they're saying that's the Messiah, the, the Messiah cut off. But the temple isn't destroyed then. In fact, the temple is not destroyed for more than five weeks of years, meaning 40 years. So it doesn't, doesn't even work. He means by this, Jesus died too early, according to Talmudic reckoning. Jesus died around 30 AD. But until the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, it still took 40 years, about five and a half weeks. So Jesus died too early, according to Talmudic reckoning, to be the anointed one. I mean, Jesus is killed in the year 40, 30. The temple's in the shore. The shovel goes on for another 40 years. In fact, church fathers were hard-pressed to explain why the temple would continue to stand after Jesus' death. Because in from the Pauline theology and what we find in Hebrews, there's no reason for a temple to continue at all. It should have been destroyed. That is what should have happened in the estimation of Christian thinkers, all of them. With the death of Christ, the curtain of the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom. This was an indication that God himself had done this. For the Old Covenant had ended with Christ's all-sufficient sacrifice, and the temple was no longer needed. Since then, it had egged out its existence as an empty shell, as a remnant and testimony of an ended religion. The Jews then completely desecrated it, when several parties in hardest fights for the power of Jerusalem fired the temple with their own catapults and mixed the blood of the sacrificers with that of the sacrificial animals. They held that it was um, James the Just who was so righteous that the temple remained standing 
for him. And then when he was killed, so then it could be destroyed. I don't want to go far uh, here. So what's happening is they have the last week before the temple's destroyed, all right? Think about that. So from 63 to 70, the second temple is destroyed in 70, half the week, we're going to the last passages of Daniel 9, Half the what's half of the week? What's half of seven years? Three and a half years. What happens three and a half years before 70? The Jews go to war with Rome. What's the result? Temples destroyed. The priesthood is cut off. The whole ecclesiastical role and function of the high priest is completely terminated. It's exactly what happens. As soon as the temple is destroyed, it's like on a, on a gun, the gun is cocked, which means the kinetic energy, the potential energy, is suddenly launched. Mashiach now can come. Bear in mind, if one of the roles of the Messianic age, the coming of the Messiah, is the building of a temple, see Ezekiel 37, the last three passages. See Ezekiel 40 through 48. If one of the things the Messiah is to do when he comes is to bring about the rebuilding of the final Messianic temple, it's explicitly in Tanakh, and the restoration of the sacrificial system, Hosea 3, 4, and 5, and so on, then the Messiah would not be coming when the temple's standing. He would be coming to an epoch in time when the temple is destroyed. Therefore, Jesus is not even qualified to be the Messiah. He came at the wrong time. That is not so. Jesus did not come at the wrong time. The rabbis have calculated wrong. But who likes to admit that? Neither the rabbis nor we Christians. Christ is not meant in this text in Daniel 9. Elsewhere in Daniel we find him. But in Daniel 9 there is talk of two other anointed princes, Cyrus and Antiochus Epiphany. <laughs> 